Hi friends and welcome back to my channel. My name is Angela. April is my birthday month. My birthday is at the end of the month and every birthday and Christmas I kind of pull together a little bit of a wish list of things that I would love to receive to give it to my husband to give him a little bit of guidance. And so I thought I might share some of those books that have been on my radar. I don't expect to receive all of these books, but these are just things that have been on my wish list. I was never really big on celebrating my birthday as an adult. I guess it felt very, it felt a little, not, not conceited or arrogant. There was something about it that just felt a bit me, me, me. And so I always just kind of kept it really quiet, kept it low and I would throw parties, of course, for my husband or my kids or whatever, but I felt like it never happened in return for me. So it was left to me to figure it out. And it was probably in the last five years, around the time I was turning 40, where I realized it's important to celebrate these milestones. Very important because you don't know what's around the corner. So I found it really important to put that on the radar, that my birthday is something I want to try and celebrate each year. And last year was, I think, what might be the start of a birthday tradition. One of my signature dishes is a paella. And I love to make it. I love to serve it. It's such a great dish to serve a crowd. Very, very easy. I have a big paella pan that serves uh, over maybe 12 people as a main meal. It's quite big. And normally I would do that indoors on the stove and then serve it outside. Last year, because my birthday is in autumn and the weather is usually really, really nice during the day, nice and warm in the sun, but then in the evening it gets a little bit cooler, I decided to do it on an open flame. So I cooked it outside and then after we had cooked the paella and everything, we had this little fire where we could toast some marshmallows. But it was really engaging to cook it with my guests, to be outdoors with them by the pool cooking this thing. It was really engaging. People were able to watch what was happening and, and ask questions and kind of get an idea of how it all worked because it isn't something that you see people make all the time. And I think I want to do that again this year. We really do love having a hospitable home. My husband really does enjoy hosting people as well. And we just love lavishing them with food and drink and, and being really good hosts. So all in all, I think it's important that we celebrate these moments and I will definitely be doing that this year. I realized that if I was being gifted gifts by my husband that perhaps weren't things that I really wanted and they were just, but he buys gifts for me that I do like. I'm getting to a point in life now where I don't want things just for the sake of them. I want to be very selective. I'm really favoring things that are made you know, um, with sustainability in mind or perhaps made from natural materials, you know, in terms of clothing, I'm really focusing on natural fibers, that kind of stuff, you know. So I've got these things in my mind that maybe I haven't articulated to him or he used to always buy me a perfume every birthday or Christmas. And now I'm trying to find an alternative non-toxic perfume. Unless I articulate that with him, he's never going to know. So I decided a while ago that I would give him a list of maybe five to eight things that were on my radar that I would love to receive as a gift and just say to him, look, here's a list. If you get any one of these things, I will be stoked. I don't need all of them, just whatever. If you see something and you think that's whatever. And so I've done that ever since and it's been really success successful. It's meant so much more that he's been buying things that, that he knows that will mean something to me. It really takes the pressure off him and I think it just makes it an overall pleasant experience. So I was in the last week, I was pulling together my wish list of things that I, I was going to give to him. And not everything is books. There are, of course, a few other things. But I thought as I was going through it, I thought I, I really would love to share with you some books that are on my radar, some books that I haven't yet bought for myself that I think would be a lovely gift to receive. And because I am a I love giving gifts. I love finding the right gift for the person. I love wrapping it beautifully. I love finding the right card, giving it to them. It's just an experience for me and I do enjoy receiving that in return. And maybe there's something that might uh, you might want to add to your list, wish list as well. And I guess the reason why I don't buy these for myself and I just hold off and put them on a wish list is because I think there needs to be some room for that flexibility of you know, you don't have to get everything at the moment you want it. You have, sometimes a bit of uh, self-deprivation is a good thing, allowing yourself to experience that waiting period uh, of wanting something and receiving something. 
you know, when you were a kid and it was Christmas and you knew you were going to get that bike you've been wishing for for months, it made the moment so much more sweet. And I feel that's why I hold off on some things. And usually they might be bigger books, coffee table books, collector's editions, things like that. Uh, whereas, you know, smaller paperbacks and novels I might buy for myself. But it depends. It really does depend on the on the item and, and that kind of thing. But that's that's kind of my methodology when it comes to putting an item onto a wish list. So the first grouping of books I have is cookbook, lifestyle books, and the first book is Old World Ita Italian by Mimi Thorison. I had followed Mimi Thorison a long time ago on Instagram when she was living in France. The, her husband uh, does all her photography and he, his photography is so beautiful. Uh, they lived in Medoc, I think, in France, and then they've recently moved to Italy. Mimi's got an interesting background where she is a Chinese French so a lot of her recipes have a little bit of a Chinese influence into it but when they moved to Italy uh, she released this book of Italian uh, food from their travels and I really do enjoy experimenting with different cuisines so this is something I'd love to receive and because the photography is so beautiful it really is almost a coffee table book as opposed to a cookbook so that is most definitely something at the top of my wish list. Another book I would love to receive is Outside by Gil Meller. Uh, Gil is someone else who I came across on Instagram. I think his background is with River Cottage. He was originally in this in that project. And he's a chef, he's a cook, he's a gardener. He really fosters an outdoor lifestyle, living seasonally, eating seasonally, foraging. It's really encouraging that outdoor cooking, outdoor being outdoors and it's something I'd like to experiment more with you know when I cook outdoors it's generally a piece of meat or something in a an enclosed Weber with gas but to be able to understand fire a little bit more to be able to cook over flame I think would be such an incredible moment to do that occasionally so this is why it's on my list this book is yet to be released I don't think it's been released until August in 2024 so it's probably going to feature on my Christmas wish list as well and it's called The Gourmand's Lemon. It's a combination of stories and recipes and it looks like a whopper of a book so again it's probably coffee table slash cookbook uh, but it looks really intriguing. The photography looks beautiful it's very clean and simple and the fact it has some stories within I think would be really interesting. So this is the summary of the book. The star of Renaissance gardens that shaped the Medici dynasty have the power to ward off scurvy, had a hand in forming the mob whose juice has been used as an invisible ink since 600 AD to pen covert messages. These joyful yellow orbs are ripe with intrigue. The gourmand charts the fruit's astonishingly intricate genealogy, explores its role as a literary device for the likes of Joan Didion, F. Scott Fitzgerald, Tom Wolfe and James Joyce and examines its unique representation of the American dream through lemonade stands. I mean, a lemon? So <laughs> it just, I'm not, I won't get it this year, like this birthday, but that just sounds remarkable. It sounds remarkable. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to hopefully receiving that at some point in the future. And that is most definitely something I want someone to give me to give it even more meaning. The next book on my radar on my wish list is The Preserving Garden. This is actually the second book in a series of four publications coming out. So, so far there is The Kitchen Garden, which came out in 2022. Uh, this one, The Preserving Garden, came out in 2023. And there are two more books to come out, The Medicinal Garden and The Picking Garden. The Medicinal one, I think, will be another wish list for me. But they are published in Australia a lot of the time, I mean, a lot of the books that we have on our shelves are maybe for British or American gardens. And I, I really do love to be able to find those Australian ones wherever possible because they'll be talking about breeds or species that flourish in Australian climates that really work with our soils. So anyway, this one is about preserving and I do vegetable garden and preserving is something I want to get better at. I don't do any canning or anything freezing and pickling is kind of my method of preserving but the pickling is a hit and miss I'm really not doing it very well so I would love to receive this one for that reason and the last book in this cookbook lifestyle category is how to split wood shuck an oyster and master other simple pleasures I think it's called it's just marketed as a field guide to life you know things that we ought to know how to do 
and things that we should want to learn how to do. And it just sounds like a little bit of fun. So I'm all for that. Uh, it's a little bit of a coffee table kind of book, but uh, I think I would really enjoy to receive that as well. It has everything from how to fold a pocket square to how to make fire cider. So it just sounds like a cute little book and it's been around for about 10 years, I think. And so now we're coming into the coffee table book category and a lot of these are garden or art focused. But the first one is A Garden Eden, which is at the top of my list. It looks like the most exquisitely illustrated book. It's, I believe it's over 200 illustrations from the National Library of Vienna. And something I really have been, really been enjoying recently is botanical illustrations. There's something about it and I, I really enjoy looking at it, but it's something I want to try. So I recently purchased some supplies for some watercoloring, which I hope to do over winter. I have tried it in the past, but really not too much. So in, able, in order to do that, I really do need some references. And so that's why this book, I think, would be incredible because the artwork in it is just extraordinary. I actually did buy a book recently for this project of maybe doing some botanical drawings, and that was The Flowers of Provence by Jamie Beck. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if I've, I think I've mentioned Jamie Beck previously in my bedtime stories uh, video where it was about books for my bedside table. But this one is just, it's, it really is just a book of photography and it's all about the flowers of Provence. Jamie Beck did this incredible project during COVID isolation where she, uh, it was called Isolation Creation, where she created something every day and photographed it. It was so much work on her part, but the imagery that came out of it was really incredible. And I have bought one of them. I haven't yet framed it. I need to frame it. But anyway, I got the Flowers of Provence because it has images like this, which I think would be really great references for when I decide to, you know, finally get into some watercoloring. But, you know, like these sort of things, I think they'd be really great references to be able to use. So these are the sort of things that I'm hoping to get a little bit more, these sort of books, you know, with these botanical illustrations. Then we have The Art of Beatrix Potter. And there are a lot of volumes out there about Beatrix Potter's life, her gardens, her artwork. This one seems to be a real definitive collection. It has some early sketches aside, her finished sketches for Peter Rabbit or, or those, those books that she did. And it you... It's also accompanied by some copy that really gives context to what's going on. So it looks really interesting. It looks like a great insight into her art. Uh, and I would love, love to receive that. Next book is Her Majesty by Christopher Warwick. I mentioned a few times, I have a background of being a photographer. So a book on photographs is definitely up my alley. And this one is beautiful. This is a book of photographs of Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth II's life from her entire lifespan. I think it's 1926 to 2022, and it is private and public moments. There's something so intriguing about it. The, the photography looks incredible. There is actually an edition I've seen online which has a different cover, and it's Queen Elizabeth when she was uh, much younger, probably just after she was crowned if not married and problem is that only I found it online but it's like $500 so it's clearly some obscure limited edition thing but anyway I'm I'd be more than happy for this one that I'm sharing with you now and it just looks beautiful and I do think it's a life to be celebrated it's a piece of history I am an anglophile to a certain extent so I, I think this would be a beautiful gift for anybody but especially someone that has an appreciation for history. This next one, The Writer's Garden, was something I saw in a bookstore recently. I saw it, I picked it up, I flipped through it and I nearly bought it but I put it back. The The idea of it is that it's it's about writers and it's about their gardens. You know these are the spaces that they would retreat to uh, when they were writing and it just sounds really fascinating so I'll read you a brief summary of it. Discover the flower gardens, vegetable plots, landscapes and writing hideaways of 30 great authors from Louisa May Alcott's Orchard House where she wrote Little Women and Agatha Christie at Greenway to Virginia Woolf at Monk's House and the Massachusetts home of Edith Wharton. Fully illustrated with specially commissioned pho photography plus archive images and spanning centuries and continents, this book visits the homes and gardens that inspired novelists, poets and playwrights. It shows how outdoor spaces were important to writers in many different ways 
and offers insight into the lives and creative processes of beloved authors. It was only published in 2023 and it sounds really intriguing. The, the, I, I love the correlation between um, the, the writer and their garden and I do think there is a, there's definitely a trend in that. You know, these writers had their spaces. They knew that they needed their zones to be creative in. So I think that would be a really lovely gift to receive. This next one is called The Plant Hunter's Atlas. And this has to be, at the, I know I've said it a few times, this has to be at the top of my list. I am a history buff. I clearly am into botanical artwork at the moment, and this has both. So I'm going to read the summary for you because it sounds intriguing. Beautifully illustrated with over 100 botanical artworks from the archives of the Royal Botanic Gardens Q, this absorbing book tells the stories of how plants have travelled across the world from the missions of the pharaohs right up to 21st century seed banks and the many new and endangered species being named every year. The illustrations are so rich, so interesting and being a history buff I love the idea of knowing a bit more about how a species came to be known, how it came to be named, where it came from originally. Uh, it just looks incredible. The artwork is beautiful. Again, it's this these illustrations accompanying it. And I just think it would be lovely. I think it was only published in 2023, so it's fairly new. But man, this looks beautiful. So now we're coming into novels, collector editions, that kind of thing. And I only have a few of these because a lot of them I would probably just buy myself. But some of these are collectors or collectibles or they're just new releases. And the first one is Clear by Karis Davies. This, I think, has been, it's been, it was released in March 2024, so it's only just come out, but it sounds really interesting. It's a short story. It's very, very slight, uh, but this is the summary. 1843, on a remote Scottish island, Ivar, the sole occupant, leads a life of quiet isolation until the day he finds a man unconscious on the beach below the cliffs. The newcomer is John Ferguson, an impoverished church minister sent to evict Ivar and turn the island into a grazing land for sheep. Unaware of the stranger's intentions, Ivar takes him into his home, and in spite of the two men having no common language, a fragile bond begins to form between them. It just sounds really interesting, and I am definitely, um, I've been fostering a bit of a fascination for Scotland recently and Scottish everything. So I, I do think that that is something that I'd really love to, to read. It sounds very, very interesting. The next novel is 14 Days, and this is a novel. Uh, so it's one story, but it's written by a collective of authors. Sounds very interesting. It's, I've seen it promoted for months and months and months, and I think it finally came out in February or March this year. So the summary is, one week into lockdown, the tenants of a Manhattan apartment building have begun to gather on the rooftop each evening and tell stories in this exciting new twist on the novel. With each passing night, more and more neighbours gather, bringing chairs and milk crates and overturned buckets. Gradually, the tenants, some of whom have barely spoken to each other before now, become real neighbours. With each character secretly written by a different major literary voice, from Margaret Atwood to John Grisham to Celeste Ng, 14 Days is a heartwarming ode to the power of storytelling and human connection. It sounds like a really interesting piece of literature history. I think it's going to be one of those moments. And the fact that it's set in the pandemic, uh, I haven't read a lot of novels with that as a major topic. So that's a novel that is definitely on my radar that I would love to receive. Another book that is a small book, but one that I would be delighted to receive and read no, regardless, is the Anthology of Scottish Folk Tales. Uh, I think this was published quite a while ago, close to eight, ten years ago, but it looks beautiful. And this is the summary. Herein lies a treasure trove of tales from a wealth of talented storytellers performing in the country today. From the selkie mother who cannot ignore the calling to the sea, to the store worm battling with Thor, and a fugitive hiding in a dark cave. This book celebrates the distinct character of Scotland's different customs, beliefs and dialects, and is a treat for all who enjoy a well-told story. I'm there. I am, I am there for that story. I think this would be a beautiful collector's edition kind of book to keep and just keep, you know, on your bedside table or maybe in your guest room for pe when people come over to read. But, um, yeah, I, I, that would be a beautiful book to have. 
And then this is a collector's edition that I would really like to, well, a collectible that I would like to have, which is the Velveteen Rabbit by Marjorie Williams, and it's the folio edition. The Velveteen Rabbit wasn't something I remember growing up knowing, but I knew the title name, and I recently bought an abridged version that I read with my grandson. He really loves it. He has a soft toy, so it's kind of a little bit of fun for him. Um, but this is a collectible and I think it would be a great addition to have. And I, I haven't read the entire thing. Like I said, the one I have is an abridged version. So I would really enjoy to receive that as well. Next up is Memoirs of a Fox Hunting Man by Sigrid Sassoon. And this is another book I picked up in a store and I put it back and I probably should have bought it. Anyway, I've added it to my wish list and I think it would be a really nice one to have. Again, I've, you know, you see a title and you start to look into it and then you read a bit more about it and you find there's a lot going on. So I'm going to just share a little bit with you about that. So about the author himself, Siegfried Sassoon was born in 1886. He served in the trenches during World War I where he began to write the poems for which he's remembered. Apart from war poems of 1919, he published eight volumes of verse during his lifetime. But it is as a novelist and autobiographer that he is perhaps best known. Sassoon's semi-autobiographical trilogy, Memoirs of a Fox Hunting Man, Memoirs of an Infantry Officer, and Sherston's Progress became classics of war-era literature. And then this particular book, The Memoirs of a Fox Hunting Man, is about, in the 1920s, a young man grappling with the horrors of the war for, from which he has just returned, decided to write about a happier time a time of cricket matches and fox hunting, the busyness of village life and the shyness of youth. Originally published anonymously, it went on to become uh, Faber and Faber's first bestseller, a classic depiction of pre-First World War Britain. It tells two mirrored stories about a boy coming of age and a country losing its innocence. I've heard conflicting reviews about it. Some people say it's great, others say it's just impossible to read. I really want to form my own, my own opinion, but Again, it sounds like a really interesting uh, piece of history and being autobiographical, I think, would be a really interesting thing. And this particular edition I've worn has this really beautiful vintage hardback cover. And then the last book I have on my on this wish list is The Wind in the Willows, uh, illustrated by Inga Moore. And there are so many variations of illustrated versions of Wind in the Willows, but from what I've seen, this looks the truest to what I remember when I read it growing up, you know, just the, the way the illustrations are. And it seems to be one of the best. It is a bridge slightly by the illustrator, but I think that's fine. And it might end up that I have a few copies of The Wind in the Willows, but there is one I think that's illustrated by E.H. Shepherd, who does the Winnie the Pooh illustrations. Um, it's really tricky when you're seeing these things online if you can't see you know, inside and see what it actually looks like. It, it's a bit hard to make a judgment call, but I have seen one of the illustrations of this particular Wind in the Willows book and it just looks so beautiful. So I would love to have that on my collection and hopefully be reading that with my grandson and other grandchildren in the future. So there we go. That is a look into my wish list of books, books that I've had on my wish list for a while. I could go on and on and on because my wish list is very, very long. But those are definitely ones that I think have a little bit of urgency to it for a variety of reasons. Let me know if you're similar. If you are, are someone that goes out and just buys every book that you want to have or do you kind of put them to the side and, and hope that someone might buy them for you in the future? Is there something that is just at the top of your wish list at the moment, one that you would be delighted to receive? So thank you so much for joining me again. Thank you for people that are commenting and subscribing. I'm really enjoying uh, talking with you in the comments. And I hope you have a lovely weekend and I will see you next week.